Glad that you are here. Whether you are a visitor or a member, we want you to know that you are loved, and we look forward to how you are going to encounter Jesus during the service. It is clear the world is promoting unrest, instituting lack, and glorifying evil. Satan is called the father of lies, lies that are crafted to instill fear and control. Jesus said in John 10:10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. At our church, we believe that Jesus is God. We believe that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We believe the Bible is the inspired word of God, and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ brings truth and freedom. No matter your past, what the devil has done to you, or battles you may be facing, God desires to deliver and transform your life for his purposes. At our church, we believe God demonstrated his love for us, and that he sent Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins, was buried, rose from the dead on the third day, and is alive today. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe it in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, that you shall be saved. We believe that Jesus ascended to heaven, and he sent the Holy Spirit into the world. We, as sons and daughters of God, operate in the power of the Holy Spirit, doing the will of God, spreading the gospel, praying for the sick, and exercising authority over all the power of the enemy. As the fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ, we believe that every area of our life should be submitted to Him. We are living in the final moments of the last days, and the soon return of the Lord is imminent. As the world grows darker, we stand in the light of Jesus and in His righteousness. Jesus is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. Are you ready to meet Him? Welcome to Elevate Church. Good morning, Elevate family. Let's rise to our feet. So first question, who was at the crusade last night? Raise your hand. Majority hands, love that. Last night was amazing. 
Lit Squad did amazing. They gave their testimony and they were definitely anointed. I'll say that. And uh, our worship team sweated out and did amazing also. They did great. And then, of course, faith came by hearing and hearing by the Word of God through our pastor. So praise God. Let's give Jesus a round right now. Yesterday we saw anywhere between 15 to 25, because we haven't found anyone to count yet, 15 to 25 come forward to receive Christ. Amen? This is Luke 15, 8 through 10. It says, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one, one sinner who repents. We had 15 to 25, so let, yes. Thank you, Jesus. So let's pray together. Let's lift our hands. Father, we come before you. We thank you that the goodness of God led those to repentance. We thank you for the transformative work of the cross. We thank you for paying the price we could never pay. Lord, we thank you that that word was heard last night. Father, we praise you for bringing those out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of marvelous light. We give you all the glory and honor and praise because without you, we could do nothing, none of it. Thank you for the anointing. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your sacrifice, and we praise you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hallelujah. The Lord says in his word, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. This morning, we have the opportunity because of our faith in Christ Jesus that as the word of God is being preached, that that word lands inside of our heart. And as we cast all of our cares upon Jesus, we know that he meets every single need that we have because he cares for us. Turn around, greet your neighbor, tell him, welcome to Elevate. God bless you. You may be seated. Ooh, those lights are bright. I think I'll move back. Hey, Brandon, I think we need to adjust these two in the middle. I don't want to blind people with my... Well, God bless you. Welcome to the second service of Elevate Church. <clears throat> I know my wife's going to comment on this one thing, but I'm so proud of you. I am. My wife and I both are so proud of you because of your serving and your generosity and, and your prayers. Well, I mean that. Man, you guys shine, and I mean it. And I want to give you an applause. My son's birthday, John, right there. There he goes. <laughs> Try to get out of here before I said it. That man is playing Gallagher. Thought we wouldn't notice, but we did. My main drummer, Levi, going out. I mean. <laughs> oh, boy, that'll cost me. Well, God bless you. Welcome. Well, this is a time of service. We want to focus on our guests. I know we have some guests. I've met a couple of you. I want to say welcome to the second service of Elevate Church. And yes, it's this good every Sunday. Amen. If you are a guest, hopefully you received a welcome packet. And in that packet is an orange connection card. My wife makes fun of the way I say orange. It's an orange connection card. Please fill it out. Drop in the offering basket when it goes by, but not before you flip it over. On the back, we've listed three nonprofits that lovingly serve the community of Lincoln. And if you'll put a check mark in, one of, in the box by one of those, we'll make a monetary donation in your behalf to that organization. Amen. 
So Elevate Family, as my wife Cleo is coming, let's give our guests a hearty round of applause. Praise God. How many of you there were there last night at the uh, crusade? Praise God. Um, I, re I really like the lit squad that was the hip hop that was there. And uh, one of the songs they had the audience participation where we had stomp on the devil's head. And that's just what happened a few years ago when I had John. We stomped on the devil's head because the devil wanted to take us out. He wanted to kill us both. In fact, the Catholic nurses at the hospital baptized John because they figured he was dying. He was dying. Yeah, he was dying, but, but God, <laughs> but God. Different plan, different plan. So uh, praise God for that. We stomped on the devil's head and we're still doing it today as we continue to serve the Lord. Amen, amen. Every time you make a choice, to move forward in God, you're stomping on the devil's head. Every time you come to church and praise and worship, you're doing it. So we want to do a lot of damage to the kingdom of the devil because we belong in the kingdom of light. Amen? Yeah. Praise God. Just want to say a big, big thank you for all of the volunteers and all of the uh, leaders of the different uh, sections that were happening last night. Just a wonderful sea of orange search, shirts there for all the volunteers. The little kids that had the backpacks, they were sporting them around. They were so proud of those new backpacks. Able to see bicycles go out of there, TVs go out of there. Praise God, your generosity and just your willingness to serve an underprivileged community, because that's where we were. And so thank you so much. We just, we can't say enough thank you. We couldn't have done it without you. And this was the Elevate Crusade. It was your crusade, and you're a big part of it. Thank you so much. We love you guys. Love you. I to get something. Just out of curiosity, how many people are here for the first time from the crusade? I know there's a few. Look at that. In the back, yeah. God bless you. Amen. And I think somebody brought a towel, right? Somebody wants to get baptized. Amen. Jesus said, baptize them. Might as well. Hallelujah. While you're at it, run this back to her. Would you please, Cleo, back there in front of us, have her put her name on there. That's our baptism list. You'll be, no, you'll be lucky number 13. Amen. <laughs> and we don't care because we're not superstitious. Amen. You know, with Jesus and the 12, that was 13. How many realize that? And they went about stomping on the devil's head. <laughs> they went about healing all that were oppressed of the devil, 13 of them. Amen. So know that. Well, ushers, would you please come? And we want to receive second service, tithe and offering. <laughs> Amen. Lord G, pray with me. Lord Jesus, we have worshiped you from our hearts with the fruit of our lips because out of your love that's in us, we thank you that you love us, you provide, you watch over us, Lord. We thank you for everything you've done, what you're doing, what you're going to do. And Lord, we continue to worship you with our tithes and with our offerings out of the same heart of love that you gave us. And we thank you in advance for our provision in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, while they're taking that up, I want to welcome those that are watching uh, via Facebook and YouTube. I want to Welcome my buddy Rick Laswell. I hope he's watching. If you are, Rick, text me. It'll buzz in my pocket. Hallelujah. This is our phone app. If you're new to Elevate, download this phone app. Just put Elevate Church in Lincoln in your search. Look for the orange arrow. That's our icon. It's free. You, you can creep on us through this app. You can look and see what we're up to. You can give on the app. You can listen to live or current or previous messages. All kinds of information on there. Our ministry, women's ministry, men's ministry, and home groups are all on there. Download that. You can also give via the app or you can give online, elevatelincoln.com slash give. And again, I want to thank this church 
for all the financial giving that you did for this crusade. You know, we didn't, people say, what are you getting out of this crusade? We're getting the privilege of honoring Jesus and serving people. Can you say amen? That's what, you can't take it with you. Nobody's taking a bicycle with them or a backpack with them or a 50 inch television with them or a car. Can't take it with you. You might as well bless people. Amen. Blessed to be a blessing. You can mail it the old fashioned way, 1235 North 69. Join us Wednesday nights. We have services for all ages, adults in here, junior and senior high next door with our wonderful youth pastors and youth leaders. Uh, thanks to Nate and Elizabeth sitting over there. Then we have a children's church, kindergarten through sixth grade. And then thanks to Nat Natasha and maybe one more, we have nursery, newborn to four years of age. So no excuse not to make it in person. If you can't make it in person, join us live, 7 p.m., Facebook and YouTube. Well, you know, today is water baptism. Now, I do know if you forgot a towel, my wife brought a couple of extra. Amen. We were going to throw them in the dirty clothes anyway, so. <laughs> no, just kidding. They're clean. So if you didn't bring a towel, this is a good slogan, Tony. We got you covered. <laughs> just thought of that. Amen. So I'll talk a little bit about baptism at the end of this. Service. If you get saved today, if you give your heart to the Lord today at the end of this service and you want to be water baptized, Praise God. You'll drive home wet, but you'll be water baptized. Amen. Eddie B, be with us next Sunday. Now, you, I know many of you don't know who this is. I know who this is. And I wouldn't have him if the anointing of God wasn't on his life. I'm telling you, this guy's an ex-gangbanger. This guy's an ex-convict. This guy, he, he's a little guy. But he today is an evangelist. He's a preacher. He's a singer-songwriter that's had number one hits in the United States and Canada. Every year, he goes to between 450, 550 jails and prisons, preaches in there. Multitudes of people get saved. And then he also, as far as I know, has the only school in America specifically targeting training for jail and prison chaplains, male or female, in Albuquerque excuse me, Albuquerque, New Mexico. He's going to be taking care of everything next week. He'll handle the praise and the worship. He'll handle the preaching. He'll handle the ministering. Eddie B., if you've never seen him, please come. And yes, he does look that intimidating. Last year when he was here, he and I, uh, I challenged him to a bottle cap contest. Anybody know how to flick a bottle cap? And uh, mine went straight to the ground. So we've been picking at each other in the last couple of months about that. I actually found a video on YouTube, how to flip a bottle cap. <laughs> and just to be fair, I sent it to him also. <laughs> so uh, we're going to have that contest. So if you happen to see any Bud Light bottle caps in my car, I don't drink. I just needed something to flick. Amen. <laughs> flick the devil's bottle caps. Hallelujah. So that next Sunday, don't miss it. All right, would you please open your Bible to the book of 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. Now, I'm telling you, God put this message on my heart last night when I was at the crusade waiting to preach what I preached last night. God began to say one word to me, and it was shift, S-H-I-F-T. Don't forget to enunciate the F, amen. I told Brad, he asked me, what's the title? I said, shift. Make sure you include the F. I'd probably get more hits on YouTube without the F, but we're going to include it. So the title of this message is shift. Are you with me? Second Kings chapter six, and we're going to pick it up. If I turn my Bible to the right place, verse 24, I got to tell you one thing before we go at this time of period. In Israel's history, Israel was a divided nation. There were two nations. There was a nation of Israel and the nation of Judah. The capital of Israel was Samaria. The capital of, of uh, 
Judah, thank you, was Jerusalem. So just know this. So we're going to pick this story up, and this is involving the nation of Israel with Samaria as its capital. Verse 24, it came to pass after this that Benadad, king of Syria, gathered all of his host and went up and besieged the capital town of Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, not a food shortage, and not just a famine, but a great famine, and he's going to describe it. He said, until a donkey's head was sold for four pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung, dove's poop, was sold for five pieces of silver. Now, the phrase cab, the cab was just under a quart or just around two pints. And of course, the birds aren't under a famine. They're all over. They're, it's Samaria that's besieged. And it's in a famine. So the birds would come and do their thing. They're scooping it up. I mean, now that's a famine. When, when you're out with a little, little stand, bird poop for sale. I'm telling you, that's a famine. So here we go. And the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall. And there cried a woman unto him. And he said, help my Lord, O king. And he said, if the Lord doesn't help you, how do you think I'm going to help you? And so he says kind of sarcastically, should I, should I go get something for you out of, the, out of the barn floor or the wine press? No, because there's nothing in there. It's gone. But then the king says to her, okay, what's bothering you? And she answered, this woman said unto me, give thy son that we may eat him today. Now that's a famine. And we will eat my son tomorrow. You know, scholars will tell you that they're, they're hoping the son was already dead. But think about this. He had withered so much that she says, we'll eat him today. And there's not enough of him for tomorrow. So tomorrow we'll eat your son. Now that, that's, that's a famine. So we boiled my son and we did eat him. And I said to her the next day, give your son that we may eat. And she hath hid her son. And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman that he tore his clothes for mourning and grief. Couldn't believe that. How would you react? I mean, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't know how to respond to that. And so he tears his clothes and he puts on sackcloth to show grieving and mourning. And the, as the people looked on him, behold, he had sackcloth upon his flesh. Then he said, what a lot of people that don't know God, that hate Christ, that hate Christians say. He said, God do so and more also to me if the head of Elisha, the son of Shapheth, stands on his head today. Elisha was a prophet, a great prophet. He followed the prophet Elijah. Elisha was the one that we talked about last Wednesday who, who served Elijah the prophet for many say eight years. What was he doing? How was he serving Elijah? He poured water on the prophet's hands. He ministered to Elijah whatever he needed. When Elijah went up in the whirlwind, then Elisha took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and Elijah, Elisha did twice as many miracles as Elijah did. And Elisha was the prophet that day. And so the king says, I tell you, God do so to me and more also if I don't take Elisha's head off his shoulders. And that's just like the world. They looking for somebody to blame. Why are they in this famine? Why is all this trouble happening to them? It's because they rebelled against the Lord. They'd gone against him. The Lord had lifted his hand off of them and the enemy had come. It's not the Christian's fault. It's not God's fault. You know, some of you, you're suffering right now things in your life. God didn't send it. No, no, no. You turn from him. You begin to go your own way. And, you know, God gave us all the power of choice. 
God gave Adam and Eve the power of choice. When God saw that they were going to exercise their power of choice and rebel against him and partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, did God stop them? No. Did God put a wall of, of steel around that tree? No. They had free choice, just like you do. And that's what this message is going is to circumvent to, is about your freedom of choice. Amen. And I'm telling you, Israel was in the predicament they were in because of the choices they made to rebel against God, to cast his law behind their back, to be, turn their backs against God and go their own way. And many times when you decide to do that, God will just lift his hand off of you. He didn't send it. People say, Pastor Mike, God sent COVID. God didn't send COVID. God's not punishing the world with COVID. Now, will God use COVID? Of course he will. Of course he'll use it. He'll use it to draw more people to himself. He'll use it to wake up the church. He'll use it to expose hypocrisy in the church, which is what he did. But God didn't send it. People, I've heard preachers say, people told them, you know, uh, we believe God sent uh, COVID to, because of abortion in America. Why would God be killing 75, 80 year old women and men? Anyway, let me go on. So here it comes. And he is mad at the person of God. Verse 32. Elisha sat in his house with the elders. And the king sent a messenger before him, before the king. And before the messenger came to Elisha, Elisha said to the elders, look. See how this son of a murderer, talking about the king has sent to take away my head. When the messenger comes, shut the door, hold him at the door, is not the sound of his master, the king's feet behind him. And sure enough, it was. Here come the messenger. They brought him in. They held him up against the door. And here comes the king. Now they're all at Elisha's house. While he yet talked, the messenger came, and behold, the king came, and the king said this, this evil is of the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? And Elisha, by the Spirit of God, is going to give a prophecy so astounding that the man, the servant whom, the, whom who served the king, he's not going to believe. And this is it, chapter 7, verse 1. Follow me. Then Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. That'd be like me standing up here and saying, about this time tomorrow, gas is going to be 69 cents a gallon and bread is going to be four loaves for a dollar. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? But I'm not speaking by thus saith the Lord, although I wish I was. And so Elisha tells him that. Well, how would you react? Then a Lord, a servant, on whose hand the king leaned, answered and said to the man of God, Behold, if the Lord would open the windows in heaven, might this thing be? And Elisha said to him rightfully, You will see it with your eyes, but you'll never taste of it. And let me throw something in here. Who is the hand of the Lord revealed to? Isaiah 53 says, who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? It's not revealed to doubters. I said it's not revealed to doubters. It's revealed to those who at this point, maybe you couldn't even believe this, but you, you know what should come out of your mouth? What should have came out of his mouth? The will of the Lord be done. Man, when you hear something so good and you, you can't, don't let negativity come out of your, don't say, I don't see how that can happen. I, I, uh, you're crazy. That'll never, why don't you just say, let the will of the Lord be done. Amen. So Elisha tells him, you'll see it, but you'll never taste of it. And now we're getting into the part of the message I want to get into. There were four men with leprosy sitting at the entering end of the gate. 
And they began to say to one another, and this is a question I want you to ask yourself. Why sit we here until we die? Why sit we here until we die? There's, and then they, they begin to reason among themselves. But that's the question I want to ask you. Why sit you here until you die? In whatever place of your spirituality you're in. Listen, in the year 2000, my wife and I, we were in a, involved in a ministry. And that ministry had took a turn against us. That minute, and people still go to this church that know what I'm talking about. They were there. Amen. And they will vouch uh, for what I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to get in a lot of detail because I'm not looking to smear anybody. But that ministry had turned against my wife and I and had shut us out of many things. Well, I was like going to be 46 that year. I didn't, I didn't, I had no plans on starting another church. Our church and just this church had merged together a few years before. Amen. And with that, my wife and I and some other people were sent from that church out on the mission field down in the Durango, Durango, Mexico. That's where we were. And so when we came out, everything was fine. We were back at that church. Uh, I was associate pastor. The other fellow was the head pastor. And it, everything was going good for about a month. And then all of a sudden, I don't know exactly what happened, but there was a change. And so for the next possibly year and a half, it was just miserable. My wife and I, we didn't know what to do. I couldn't hear the voice of the Lord for some reason, probably because who knows what, anger or whatever, I couldn't hear it. And so we went down to Georgia to visit uh, some of our relatives. And on the way back, we stopped in a little town, Liberty, Mississippi, and went to a church called New Day Church of a pastor who had supported us when we were on the mission field. His name was James Dawson, not Dobson, Dawson, D-A-W-S-O-N. And so we stopped there. Now, Brother James Pastor Dawson, he knew a little bit about what we were going through, but not a lot, because we, we just didn't tell him a lot. There was nothing he could do. But he knew a little bit. But that day, we sat in that service, probably about 250 people were there. And he began to preach this message right here. Why sit we here until we die? Now, Cleo and I had been praying. We'd been praying, God, show us what to do. God, we, we don't know what to do. We need your guidance. We need your help. But for a year and a half, we didn't know what to do. There we sat in that service, and he preached. You ever been to a service where it's like the preacher's preaching right to you? And everybody else might as well go home. And like all of a sudden, you don't see anybody. All you have is tunnel vision for that preacher. And you, you think for sure he was eavesdropping on your conversations. Amen. And so he preached this message. Why sit we here until till we die? And man, I'm not kidding you. I still have the bulletin from his church from 22 some years ago at my house with my notes in it. We went back to our room where we were staying. And I know Cleo and I got together. I said, Cleo, we've got to make a move. We, we've got to make a change. Something's got to happen. I said, we are dying in there. Our ministry is stifled and we, we are dying. Something's got to happen. I said, you know what? Let's go back and, and, and tell that pastor that we are, we, we're done, that we will be out by the end of August, and, and, and we're done. I said, Cleo, I don't, I don't even care if I have to go get a secular job. Praise God, I'll do it. But let, let, can we agree? And so we agreed. And the moment we agreed in prayer, I kid you not, there was a great burden lifted. And the joy of the Lord came back into our lives. We went back. We told that pastor, amen, because he's good. We told that pastor, hey, by the end of August, we're out of here. He got excited. Because he was wanting to get rid of us. He got excited. And anyway, and that's how Elevate Church got started. So Elevate Church got started out of a dismal situation that God used to kick us out of the nest. Can you say amen? <laughs> yeah. And so they begin to reason among themselves. Why sit we here? Until we die. Now listen, 
There's not a preacher coming up and preaching to them. Amen. They're, they didn't go to some uh, camp meeting or revival service and hear this. They just begin to reason among themselves, just like the prodigal did in Luke's gospel. You know, the prodigal that left his father's house and spent all of his living, on, all of his money on riotous living. And here he is, a Jewish boy, went to work for a Gentile farmer, which he wasn't supposed to do. And then beyond that, he also had to feed that Gentiles, pigs, his hogs, which is exact. That's the mercy of the devil, see? The devil hates you. The devil wants you in the pig pen. The devil wants you compromising after compromising after comp one step after another until the Bible said that prodigal was so hungry and the key words there, no man gave to him that he's feeding the hogs their slop and he begins to look at their slop. And he begins to think, I'm hungry. If it's good enough for pigs. And the Bible says before he could put the pig slop in his mouth, he came to himself. Not a revival, not a preacher. He came to him. Well, let me ask, when are you going to come to yourself? Too many people, they're just waiting for a preacher or a word or a revival. No, you've got a brain. Amen. One preacher said, God gave us a brain so we could give him a break. Amen. <laughs> and that prodigal said, what am I doing? Are not my father's servants, aren't they well kept and well fed? I know I can't go back as, as a son, but I can go back as a servant. Well, here's these lepers, and they start to reason. Let's read it in the next verse. And so they're sitting there. They're dying. They got leprosy. Leprosy kills you. And they say, look, why are we sitting here? What, what in the world are we doing? And then they say, well, let's talk about it. In verse 4, they said, if, if we go in the city, well, the famine's there. If we keep going to this dead church, come on, the famine's there. You're starving in dead churches. You're starving in churches where the Spirit of God is not allowed to move, where there's doves dung evidence that the Spirit of God had been there, but he's not there now. They said if we go in, into the city, if we go into that church, we're, we're going to die. They said, if we sit here, we're going to die. There needs to be a shift. See, some of you, you've been in park too long. Hear me. You've been in park about your relationship with Christ. You've been in park about your relationship with your spouse. You've been in park about your relationship with your children and others. Time to get out of park. Time to move and put it in drive and make some kind of a move towards God. You got to do it because the more you sit there in park, you're going to die. Your relationship's going to die. Your health is going to die. Your spiritual growth is going to die and maybe already has. They, so they begin to reason. I love this, that they begin to reason. Why sit we here till we die? Okay, let's talk about it. Should we go into this city? No, there's famine there. There's death there. We go there, we're going to die. Well, maybe we should just keep staying here. No, we're dying. We're going to keep dying if we stay here. Well, they only had one other alternative, and that was make a move towards the enemy. And so here's what they thought. Well, Let's go reveal ourselves to the enemy. It may be that they may take us in, but if they kill us, we're no better, worse off than we are right now. I've got good news for you. You don't have to make a move towards the enemy. No, you can make a move towards God. You, you, can, you can sit there and say with these, why, what am I doing? Why, why is my spirituality plateauing? Why don't I feel the presence and the power of God? Should I just sit here? Should I go to this dead church? Or should I make a move towards God? No, why don't you make a move towards God? Why don't you come to the decision and, and just admit, I'm dying where I'm at. What I'm doing is not working. I don't want to be the definition of insanity where I keep doing the same thing, but I get no different result. But I expect one. 
You know that's the definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over while at the same time expecting things to be different. They're not going to be different until you make a move. Hello, God gave you free choice. And you can choose to stay at the gate and die or you can choose to make a move. Pastor, I'm fearful to make a move. Make it anyway. If you don't, you're going to die where you're at. Pastor, I don't, I don't know. Listen, God's not out to, to damn you. God's not out to hurt you. God's not out to embarrass you. No, God's out to bless you. God's out to fill you with the Holy Ghost. God is out to prosper you. God is out to use you as a vessel of honor. But you got to make a move. Pastor, I'm waiting on God. No, God's waiting on you. God's done everything that he could do. He's not going to make a robot out of you. I love Jesus. I will worship. No, he wants willing vessels. See, some of you, you're still, and, and I say this as a loving rebuke, because I turn around and I watch, or I'll go in the back and I watch, and during worship, and, and some of you think you're spiritual. I could call a name out right now, but I won't because it embarrass you. Some of you think you're spiritual, but here's how you do in worship. Like, I wonder why God's not real to me. Well, you're not real with him. What, what do you want? You want him to put strings on you? Like a puppet? He's not going to do it. I'm saying this to help you. Pastor, I'm offended. Well, get over it. Get over the offense. Because until you do. There's people that purposely come late so they can avoid the worship. And then you wonder, why, why doesn't God heal me? Why doesn't God bless me? Why don't you make a move and open up, even if, you know, the only person that's going to be embarrassed is yourself because you talked yourself into it. No one else is going to go, hey, that guy's got his hands up. Look at that couple. They came and knelt the altar. <laughs> but that's what the devil tells you, and you believe it. Look at that person. They're dancing before the Lord. Why sit you there till you die? So, here comes the good part I like. Oh, I like all this, but... Verse 5, so they rose up in the twilight. I'm glad it didn't say midnight. I'm glad it was the dawn of a new day. Amen. Because listen, when you make a move for God, that's your dawn of a new day. So they rose up to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, nobody was there. So they went a little further into the camp. Nobody was there. They, they, they opened up a tent and there was food cooking in a pot. Nobody was there. There were goblets full of, of all kinds of beverage. Nobody was there. There was gold and silver and precious garments laying all, and nobody was there. Why? Oh, I love this part. Verse 6. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians 
to hear a noise of chariots, a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel, he's hired the armies of the Hittites and the armies of the Egyptians, and they are coming after us. Now get this. Four men, four pairs of feet, eight feet, right? Eight feet. They're walking, and all they hear is their feet on the desert sand. But what God causes the enemy to hear I said, what God causes the enemy to hear are chariots, horses, and armies come, and they just took off for their lives. And man, I mean, it, gosh, it almost looked, no, I better not say that. No, I'll say it. Almost looked like a BLM night in one of the major cities, amen. Rushing into Best Buy, rushing into, okay, edit that, thank you. Never mind, went out live, went out live. So they go, and they're, man, they're rejoicing, of course. And it's finally one of them says, hey, what we're doing is not right. We need to go back, and we need to tell our people, hey, the Syrians are gone, and they've left all this spoil. And so they went back. Well, course, who's going to believe four lepers? You know, the king's like, it's a trap. He must have watched Star Wars. It's a trap. <laughs> they're trying to lure us out to kill us. So what's the king do? He sends some people to the Syrian camp, right? You, uh, trust but verify, amen. So he sends them out and they come back and they said, king, it's just like these lepers said. The Syrians are gone. There's all kinds of food. There's all kinds of drink. There's all kinds of, of, of material wealth out there. And so the Lord, the servant, whom the king leaned on, he was in charge of the gate. Well, when the people heard from credible source, there's food and there's drink. And I mean, what would you do if you've had, hey, what are we having tonight? Well, I got some doves dumb. So they just bust through that place. And the servant gets knocked over on the ground. So he heard it. He saw it because they brought some stuff back and he was trampled to death according to the word of the Lord. Could I have a pianist come please? So my question to you is this. Why sit you here until you die? Why are you sitting in your pride, in your rebellion, in your bitterness, in your resentment? You know how many people I pray for and they'll say, I've got arthritis, I've got uh, stiffening, in my body, and one of the first questions I'll ask them, and they want prayer, and I'm happy to pray, and one of the first questions I'll ask them is, well, do you have any bitterness or resentment or unforgiveness toward anybody? And many times they'll go, well, yeah. Okay, there's a Bible verse that says that envy, bitterness, unforgiveness is rottenness to the bones. Did you know that? Did you know that medical science finally caught up with the Bible? And they'll tell you that too. Why sit you in your bitterness until you are consumed? Why sit in your unforgiveness? Are you satisfied with where you're at spiritually with the Lord? It's not his fault. You're exactly you're exactly where you have placed yourself. But the good news is, you don't have to stay there. You can grow. Man, the one thing I love about the fruit of the Spirit is when, they, when Paul writes about the fruit, not the gifts, the gifts are great, but the gifts operate as the Spirit wills. Fruit is evident in every believer's life. What I love about the fruit, he says, when he gets done listing all nine fruits of the Spirit, he says, against such there is no law. In other words, you can have as much of the fruit of the Spirit as you want. What's it take, Pastor? Simple. Jesus, here I am. Jesus, I surrender to you. Lord, I forgive everyone 
who I had anything against, everyone who's abused me, everyone who's spoken against me, everyone who's, who's tricked me, used me, stolen from me, everyone who's smeared my reputation, everyone who's drugged my name through the mud, Lord, everyone who's taken me financially, Lord, I forgive them. I loose them. I let them go. And Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me and I receive it right now. Now you're on your way. In the Bible, Jesus, in a parable, he compared forgiveness and he called it cancellation of debt. You see, when somebody hurts you, however they did it, physically, verbally, financially, relationally, when they hurt you, you feel that, 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 that they're indebted to you, that they owe you an apology. They owe you to say they're sorry. You may never get it. And some people are waiting for that, and so they are sitting there dying. God can't use them because they won't submit. Oh, here comes another sermon. You got another hour? Because they won't submit to the... See, this... It says in Peter that God's word is either a stepping stone to help propel you to your next step of spiritual maturity or it's a stumbling block that you fall over. Why? Because you won't submit to the word. And when the word of God, I'm telling you, someone's stuck here. When the word of God tells you to forgive and you refuse to forgive, you're going to keep stumbling over that word of God and your spiritual growth is going to be stunted. And you may say, well, Pastor Mike, you don't know what they did to me. And you're right, I don't. But it can't be anything close to what we did to cause God to put his own son to death on the cross and to suffer greater than any human being has ever suffered. I know it hurts. I know abuse hurts. But it's going to hurt you worse the, more you, the longer you carry it around. Man, I feel we need to do that. And listen, I don't need to call you up front because... My laying hands on you or any preacher laying hands on you is not what's needed. What's needed is an act of your will, your choice. You choose to forgive. You know, in the Bible, it's a command. God didn't say, hey, forgive if, if you feel like it. No, he commands all believers forgive even as he, for Christ's sake, forgave us. How did he forgive us? No strings attached. No, we came to him and we said, forgive me. And he did it. And he, he said, if you don't forgive others, he said, ne Jesus said, neither will your father in heaven forgive you of your trespasses. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to pray on that for a minute. I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to stand. But I'm going to ask you to be honest with yourself while you're sitting. I don't need you to stand. I don't, I don't have an agenda to fill. But you know who you are. And Jesus knows who you are. And, and I'm sorry for the, for the physical sexual abuse that happened to you. I'm sorry for the financial abuse that happened to you. I'm sorry that people ridiculed you and made fun of you and drug you through the mud. But you are only hurting yourself by holding on to that unforgiveness. And you say, well, they don't deserve it. Well, neither did you. Well, they didn't ask me for it. God told you to forgive. So right now, right where you're, if this is you, I want you to pray right now. I want you, let's just all pray. We want to help you with this. Let's just all pray this prayer and mean it. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your forgiveness in my life. And Jesus, I submit to you and your word. And so as an act of my will, in obedience to you, not by my feeling, 
but by my faith in you, I forgive everyone who's hurt me, harmed me, ridiculed me. I forgive them all in the name of Jesus. I loose them, I cancel their debt, and I let them go free. And Jesus, I repent, and I ask you to forgive me, and I receive it right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Give me. And I'm telling you, if you pray that and you meant it, when you walk out of here, you're going to be free. And that is, it's at those times, man, where you need to say, Jesus, I'm coming after you. Jesus, I'm going to worship you like I never have before. Lord Jesus, I'm going to seek you in your word like I never have before. Jesus, I'm going to seek you in prayer like I never have before. If you're here today, let me give this call out. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life, Maybe you believe in him and you say, yeah, I believe in him, Pastor. If you were to ask me, hey, do you believe in you? Oh, yeah, I believe in you. But you've never opened up your life. You've never surrendered, submitted yourself. Or if you're here today and at one time you walked with the Lord, but for whatever reason, you turned your back on him. But today you're saying, Pastor, I want to recommit my life to the Lord. So those two questions, if you say, Pastor, I want to receive Jesus Christ as the Lord of my life. Or Pastor... I want to repent, and I want to come back and rededicate my life to the Lord. If that's you, please stand up right where you're at. I want to pray for you right where you're at, if that's you. If that's you, please stand up. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who's around you, who you came with. There's two. Pastor, I need Jesus Christ in my life. There's another. There's three. Pastor, I need to recommit my life to Jesus Christ. Come on, anyone else? You're not standing for me. You're standing for the King of Kings. You that are standing, close your eyes, and I want you to begin talking to Jesus. He loves you, he hears you, and he sees you. And begin telling this, say, Jesus, I ask you, come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Anyone else? There's three right there. Anyone else? going to wait a few more seconds. Anyone else? Amen. Let's all stand. We're going to pray this prayer. Then I'm going to spend three minutes on water baptism. You that stood, I don't know if you're standing to rededicate or if you're standing to get saved, but everybody close your eyes. You, you that stood, please say this to Jesus and mean it because my praying for you not going to save you but you're praying to Jesus he will save you amen and we're all going to join in support say Lord Jesus I thank you that you love me I thank you for your word Jesus I ask you forgive me of my sins come into my life be my Lord and be my Savior. Give me your life. Give me your nature. Lord Jesus, I receive you. I receive your life. I receive your nature right now. And I tell you, you're my Lord. You're my Savior. You're my healer. You're my deliverer. And I praise you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And you three, Michael is going to get you a, those, right, those packets. And Michael will be standing at the door right there, the exit door. Please grab one of those when we go. Real quick, I'll leave you standing, so I'll say this quick. We're going to go out to be baptized. Uh, you that are going to be baptized, here's how this works. 
Uh, you're going to go change in the men's and women's bathroom in just a second. And then we're going to line up out there. Anybody wants to stay, we got a few seats out there. Please save those for those that may need a seat worse than you do. Amen. Under the awning. And then uh, you have to give a testimony. Now, this is what I mean by that. You say, Pastor, I really don't want to go into my life. Fine. But you need to look at the people and say unashamedly, my name is Michael Eskenazi. <laughs> I was a dirty, rotten sinner. No. I'm just... <laughs> But you need to say your name and that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life. And you're thank, something like that. You need to confess his Lord. If you can't do that, don't line up to be baptized. Amen. If you do give a testimony, and I mean this, three minutes or less. Don't start with, well, my mom and dad came over from Europe. I was born by a river in a little tent. Amen. God bless you. May his face shine upon you. May the Lord richly bless the work of your hands, your families, and yourself in Jesus' name. So go change. And those that are going to be baptized, I'll meet you outside.